Hello viewers, welcome to Newsweek South Asia, a show where we will provide you fresh insights into South Asia's geopolitical, strategic and security situation. Let's begin the show with the headlines first. Blasphemy allegations spark brutal mob attack on Christian man in Sargoda, Pakistan. Free Balochistan movement raises alarm on Pakistan's nuclear arsenal. And Pakistan asks Afghanistan to turn in TDP terrorists involved in attack on Chinese nationals. Pakistan's stringent blasphemy laws, which have become even harsher since January 2023, continue to spark violent reprisals and unrest. These laws, often misused, disproportionately target minority groups, creating an atmosphere of fear and insecurity. This was demonstrated in Sargoda city in Pakistan, where a Christian man named Nazir Masih was brutally attacked by a mob over suspicions of discrediting the Quran. The Human Rights Commission of Pakistan expressed profound concern, highlighting the failure of law enforcement to protect religious minorities amidst increasing blasphemy-related violence. A report. In Pakistan's eastern Punjab province, Sargudha city, a Christian man named Nazir Masih was brutally attacked by an angry mob over suspicions of blasphemy. Police officials reported that Masih was accused of desecrating the Quran, a charge that often leads to violent reprisals in Pakistan. Viral videos on social media captured the mob stealing his belongings during the assault. Five other Christians were also injured in the attack. The Human Rights Commission of Pakistan has expressed profound concern over the safety of Christians in Sargudha city following this incident. Approximately 450 individuals, including 50 identified suspects, surrounded Masih's home and shoe factory, accusing the elderly man of desecrating a religious book. The mob set fire to the factory nearby shops and houses, subjecting Masi to brutal treatment. Even 60, 70 lakh mall was burned and was And the people who were in the जो है वो नारेबाजी हो रही थी तो वहां तो जाना भी बड़ा मुश्किल था क्योंकि पुलिस और रेंजर जो थी वो मकान के चारों तरफ खड़ी थी और फिर आस्ता-आस्ता दूसरे अफसर आए तो वो बस नारेबाजी करते रहे और इस तरह के यही कहते रहे कि काफरों को मार कर छोड़ेंगे काफरों को मार कर ब्लास्फेमी एक्यूजेशंस इन पाकिस्तान ऑफन इनसाइट मॉब वायलेंस लीडिंग टू लिंचिंग्स even before legal proceedings can take place. Convictions for blasphemy are common, with at least 50 individuals currently in custody on such charges. Since 1990, at least 80 people have been killed over blasphemy allegations. A Pakistani Christian man speaking anonymously described living in constant fear due to the pervasive threat of blasphemy accusations. He highlighted the systemic failure of Pakistan's state departments to protect minority communities, accusing law enforcement agencies of tacitly facilitating perpetrators rather than safeguarding victims. As a 27-year-old Pakistani Christian who has never been abroad since the day that I have been born and till the moment that I am standing over here, I and each Christian who, is, who calls himself a Pakistani lives under fear, lives under pressure, lives under a constant threat of being, God forbid, uh, alleged to have committed uh, blasphemy. And what has happened today in Sargoda is a realization of that. This begs the question whether the Punjab police, whether the Pakistani law enforcement agencies, be it the MI, be it the ISI, who are under a mandate to safeguard us 
who are an, under a mandate to safeguard Pakistani Christians, who are under a mandate to uh, secure law and order situation all across Pakistan. Instead of following their lawful duty, instead of ensuring what they, what they get paid to do, they seem to be tacit facilitators of the perpetrators. In January 2023, Pakistan's already stringent blasphemy laws were further tightened, increasing the minimum penalty for insulting individuals associated with Prophet Muhammad from 3 to 10 years in prison, along with a fine of 1 million Pakistani rupees. The Human Rights Commission of Pakistan has raised alarms over the potential for increased abuse following the recent legislative charges which disproportionately affect minority groups such as Ahmadis, Christians, and Shia Muslims. An alarming example of this oppression occurred in Janawala, where a mob burned down 24 churches and over 80 Christian homes following blasphemy allegations. The rise in sectarian violence has led several countries, including the United States, the United Kingdom, and Canada, to advise their citizens against traveling to Pakistan. This advisory adds to the existing travel restrictions due to terrorism and other conflicts, further highlighting the country's security challenges. Until significant changes are implemented, the threat of blasphemy-related violence will continue to loom over Pakistan's religious minorities, casting a shadow over their daily lives and their hopes for a safer, more inclusive future. To delve deeper into this critical discussion, today we have with us Tilak Deveshan, an author renowned for his expertise in security matters, particularly concerning India's neighborhood, with a keen focus on Pakistan and Afghanistan. Hello, sir. Welcome to our show. The recent violent incident in Sargoda, Pakistan, where a 70-year-old Christian man was attacked by a mob on suspicion of blasphemy, is a tragic reflection of the deeply rooted issues of religious intolerance and the misuse of blasphemy laws in Pakistan. So, sir, what's your perspective on this tragic incident? Uh, it's, it's very true because this is just symptomatic. You know, this is one incident which is symptomatic of all the pressures and problems and violence that minorities in Pakistan, whether it's Christian, whether it's Hindus, whether it's Ahmadiyyad and now even the Shias, have to face and how the blasphemy law is being misused basically for personal interest because there is no defense, you know, a poor minority person who somebody comes and accuses him that he has conducted or indulged in blasphemy. And there is no defense because the mob immediately gets together and they feel that they are burnishing their credentials, their religious credentials by attacking this man. And nobody waits for the law and order machinery to take charge, but they attack, they lynch the person, they destroy his house, they destroy his property, they lose to his property. So it's just symptomatic of one of the many things that is going wrong in Pakistan. Well, sir, this is not an isolated incident. Last year, 24 churches and 86 homes of Christians in Jarawala city in Pakistan were attacked. How do blasphemy laws in Pakistan create an environment that enables or encourages mob violence? Yeah, so that uh, last year's incident was especially violent because the number of Christian churches and homes were attacked over a long period of time. And this certainly, you know, it just shows that the blasphemy laws are like a sword which are hanging on the heads of the minorities and can be picked up anytime. In the case of Jaranwala, the calls to attack these churches came out from mosques. And one of the organizations that has been involved in such violence on blasphemy is the Tehrik al Pakistan, when itself was helped to be created by the establishment when they wanted to use it in the elections of 2019 to cut down the support of the Muslim League Nawaz. So it is a state-created uh, organization and they use the blasphemy law whenever uh, you know uh, they want to attack the minorities. So it's a very serious and a very difficult situation for the minorities. To what extent is the Pakistani government accountable for the rise in religious intolerance and violence against minorities? It's true because, you know, what is taught in government schools, this is the basic issue starts from that. I'm not talking about madrasas, I'm talking about government schools. The hatred for the minorities, whether it is the 
uh, Christians, the Hindus, the Jews, the uh, Ahmadiyyas is part and parcel of the curriculum of what's called Pakistan studies in government schools. Then of course you have the madrasas which again take the uh, uh, sort of uh, hatred for the minorities to a different level. So the government is definitely culpable in this and they have not taken any steps knowing fully well that this situation, this problem is there. Every time there's an incident, people will go and make visits. Politicians will say, we must do something. Nothing happens till the next incident takes place. So this is a rampant and the government is largely culpable. Besides blasphemy accusations, what other forms of persecution do minorities face in Pakistan? You see, you take the case of the Hindus, especially the Hindus in Sindh. They are being pushed to the wall. You know, the biggest and the most frightening thing what is happening to the Hindus in Sindh is the forcible, the, the kidnapping and forcible conversion of minority or, uh, you know, uh, young Hindu girls who are minors. They are picked up, they are kidnapped, they are forcibly converted, they are beaten and either married to a much older man, sold into prostitution and the police does nothing. Even if the case does reach court, the court will always take the side of the uh, Muslim and say that the girl has agreed that she's done it, consent herself. You see, the fact of the matter is, as some politicians said, the age of voting is 18 years. Yet you expect a 12 and 13 year old girl, a Hindu 12 or 13 year old girl, to accept Islam on herself, you know, without even knowing what it is all about. And she is threatened that if you say no before the judge or you uh, make a complaint, we'll wipe out your family. So the poor girl is so scared. So this is the most frightening thing that is happening to the Hindus. Then their temples are frequently targeted because it is valuable property. People wants to want to build either a mosque or a commercial property. So in so many different ways, you know, the Hindu communities apart from the Christians. And then of course you have the uh, Ahmadiyyas who have been constitutionally declared as non-Muslims. And then serious punishments have been uh, imposed that if they call themselves Muslims or if they call their places of worship as mosques, you know, they're all liable to be uh, punished. And the interesting thing is that in 1944, before Pakistan was created, Muhammad Ali Jinnah was asked that can Ahmadiyyas join the Muslim League? And his reply was, yes, as per the constitution of the All India Muslim League, Ahmadiyyas are most welcome to come and join, uh, join the party. So since then, once what Jinnah had said in 44 till today, you can see the transition or the distance that Pakistan has traversed in becoming a much more intolerant and a frightening place for minorities. How does religious intolerance in Pakistan impact regional stability and security in South Asia? Well, uh, you know, not, uh, not directly, but any kind of intolerance, any kind of radicalization in one country, which is sitting in, you know, as a sort of a link between South Asia, Central Asia, West Asia, you know, it does create and send out ripples in different countries also. And this, I think, is going to be what is, um, you know, which all the regional countries would be worried about that the growth of radicalization, the growth of sectarianism, the growth of violence against minorities, the traditions of minorities, but very few minorities are actually left as compared to 47. Now they're already targeting the Shias, which are about 20% of the population by saying that Shias should also be declared non-Muslim. Soon the Sunni groups will start turning against each other. You know, when whether it's the Deobandis will start calling the uh, Barelvis and the Ali Hadith as Kafir and, and vice versa. In fact, so this kind of uh, intolerance and sectarianism is, will only grow because it is not being checked. Not being checked, in fact, it is being encouraged by the Pakistani state for very narrow political gains. Thank you so much, sir, for your insights. Pakistan a country that has long supported terrorism despite international condemnation and warnings, now finds itself ensnared in the very web it helped weave. The Tehreek e Taliban Pakistan, TTP, an offshoot of the Afghan Taliban, has repeatedly targeted Pakistan. A recent attack on Chinese engineers, Islamabad is urging the Taliban to take decisive action against the TTP. The country is demanding the arrest of the terrorists involved in the Shangla district attack in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa and accuses the Afghan Taliban of harboring anti-Pakistan terrorists. We have this report. Tensions between Pakistan and the Taliban are rising again. 
Pakistan has urged the Afghan Taliban to act against the Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan following its claims linking the TTP to a March 26 terrorist attack on Chinese engineers. On March 26, 2024, a convoy of 12 vehicles carrying Chinese nationals from Islamabad to the Dasu hydropower project in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa was attacked about 6 km after crossing Basham city on the main Karakoram highway. Pakistan's interior minister Mohsin Naqvi emphasized that Islamabad had shared evidence of Afghan linkage to the Basham attack with the interim Afghan government. However, there has been no positive response from Afghanistan so far. Pakistan demands the arrest of the three TTP terrorists involved in the attack. Additionally, they call for the detention of the entire TTP leadership including Noor Wali Mehsood. Minister Naqvi stressed the action against the TTP is crucial for maintaining friendly relations between the two neighboring countries. The TTP are fighting a war against the terrorists of Pakistan army. Now the question is that they wanted uh, TTP fighters. Who are they? They are Pakistani nationals. They were created by Pakistan army to counter Ashraf Ghani's government in Afghanistan. So Taliban have said to Pakistan army that you are blaming us that TTP fighters are in Afghanistan. How come they are Afghan in Afghanistan? And if they are in Afghanistan, how come they come all the way from Afghanistan to the border and then from border of Pakistan Afghanistan which is Duran line? From there they cross entire Waziristan, entire KP province and then they reach to Punjab to, uh, to wage war. What is your number one army doing? it means that it is done by the designs of pakistan army few days back the pakistani army reported that seven soldiers and 23 ttp terrorists died in three separate clashes the army claimed that these terrorists were involved in numerous attacks against security forces and innocent civilians Since the TDP ended its ceasefire with the Pakistani government in November 2022 there has been a surge in terrorist activities particularly in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa The region has witnessed 416 terrorist attacks since November 2022 It has become clear that Pakistan which had harbored and supported Taliban leaders for decades is now facing the bitter consequences of its past actions. Pakistan's former Prime Minister Imran Khan once celebrated the Taliban's rise, calling it a liberation from slavery and deeming the new Taliban regime as pro-Pakistan. However, the grave consequences of such statements have become apparent over time. Pakistan celebrated Taliban's victory in Afghanistan saying that uh, they are the true Afghans and they uh, managed to defeat America and this and that and at that time it was prime minister Imran Khan and Imran Khan second name is Taliban Khan we remember that when uh, in Nawaz Sharif's time TTP was asked to negotiate and TTP had said to Nawaz Sharif that okay we send Imran Khan on our behalf so at that time in KP it was uh, imran khan's government in center in islamabad it was imran khan's government so taliban were welcomed but then imran khan was sent to jail imran khan was uh, his uh, government was uh, disposed of taliban got angry ttp got angry and it is not that they are uh, they have got stronger no they are strong since beginning until now they have same strength agenda has changed and now there is no soft corner for pakistan for ttp and they are taking revenge they want to bring sharia in 2021 
Pakistan initially supported the Taliban's takeover of Kabul and encouraged global cooperation with the Taliban, even advocating for aid to be provided to them. However, Pakistan's position shifted as it sought the Taliban's help in combating the Tehreek-e Taliban Pakistan. Despite ideological similarities between the Taliban and TTP, Islamabad hoped the Taliban would exert influence over the TTP. However, the reality on the ground has been different. A United Nations report revealed that the Taliban sympathizes with TTP aims. Pakistan too bears responsibility for regional terrorism. While blaming the Taliban rulers for supporting TTP, Islamabad cannot ignore its own role in the increasing terrorist activities which pose a significant security challenge in the region. Amidst growing concerns over the consequences of Pakistan's nuclear tests, the Free Balochistan movement has intensified its campaign, raising alarm over the severe impacts on the Baloch people. Protests organized by the movement's branches in Germany, the United Kingdom and the Netherlands have highlighted the environmental degradation and health issues caused by nuclear activities in Balochistan. The movement is calling for international intervention to address the ongoing suffering and human rights violations in the region. A report. On May 28, 1998, Pakistan conducted nuclear tests in Balochistan's Chagai region, leaving an enduring imprint marked by health adversities and ecological distress. The fallout has been linked to a surge in ailments among the Baloch populace encompassing cancer, thyroid disorders, genetic anomalies, and reproductive health issues. Furthermore, the environmental fallout stemming from nuclear radiation and waste has cast a shadow over farming, livestock rearing, and overall ecological equilibrium in the area. The recent demonstrations staged by the Free Balochistan movement across Germany the United Kingdom and the Netherlands aim to spotlight the grave aftermath of Pakistan's nuclear experiments in Balochistan. Protesters distributed informational materials articulating grievances against Pakistan's persistent human rights violations in the region. Accusations were leveled against Pakistan for allegedly stockpiling nuclear assets in Balochistan's urban centers, including Khuzdar and Sumaini. The movement underscored the menacing threat posed by Pakistan's nuclear arsenal, cautioning against its potential for regional and global instability. Today we are here in front of International Court of Justice for a reminder. 26 years ago, on May 28, 1998, Pakistan detonated nuclear bombs in the mountains of Chagi in occupied Balochistan. It was called a nuclear test, but we consider it a nuclear attack on the Baloch nation because its effects are no way less than a nuclear attack. From the effects of which Balochistan has not yet emerged, many people lost their lives due to the unholy act. Many are disabled till today. Even today there are children suffering from various congenital diseases on which skin diseases are especially common. Disarmament of Pakistan's nuclear arsenal is necessary not only to address the immediate threats posed by Pakistan's nuclear weapons, but also to prevent the proliferation of such arms and to foster regional and global stability. Pakistan's possession of nuclear weapons has heightened tensions in the South Asian region. Moreover, the risks of nuclear weapons falling into the hands of extremists or non-state actors are ever-present, further emphasizing the imperative for disarmament. Freedom for Freedom for International cooperation and diplomatic efforts are essential in facilitating the disarmament process, ensuring transparency and promoting confidence-building measures among nations. 
International Court of Justice, human rights organizations and the United Nations should take notice of the cruelty and genocide bring to Pakistan. It, if it is not possible to fix what happened to the Baloch nation in past, but for our future, we appeal to the international community, International Court of Justice to put a complete ban on Pakistani nuclear program so that not only Balochistan and the region remain safe, rather the whole world should get rid of this danger because Pakistan's nuclear program was never for peaceful purposes and never will be. They should play their role in blocking the path of Pakistan for peace and security. The Free Balochistan movement utilizes various platforms to amplify their message in different countries. The FBM engages in advocacy efforts, lobbying international organizations, governments and human rights groups to intervene and address the ongoing suffering and human rights violations in Balochistan. Despite facing challenges and opposition, the Free Balochistan movement remains steadfast in their commitment to achieving their objectives. Their campaign continues to gain momentum, attracting attention and support from around the world as they strive to bring about positive change for the Baloch people and their homeland. And with that, we come to the end of this edition of Newsweek South Asia. We'll be back next week with more news, views and analysis from the subcontinent. Meanwhile, do keep writing to us at nwsa.inin.com. This is Shivangi Mishra signing off on behalf of the entire production team of Newsweek South Asia. Goodbye and take care.